About a month or so ago, I was asked to hold a meeting in Harlingen, Texas, and they requested that I preach on the journey of man. I debated for a long time. I knew about the meeting for a long time coming up to that. debated for a long time how to handle that subject and what approach to take. And I ultimately took an approach that's kind of a multifaceted approach, and I kind of want you guys to get the concept behind it because I want to deliver to you guys over time what I delivered to them during that week meeting. So there's 10 sermons related to it, and I'll walk you through kind of what I've, did, what I've done with it. But you've got the man, Jesus Christ, that pre-existed before the world. That's one track. And then Jesus Christ ultimately dying on a cross and ultimately his second coming. That's one track of the journey of man. Another track is you've got Adam, the first man created, or the first created man. And so we tracked the, what we see in Scripture related to Adam. And then we also saw the fall uh, with Cain and Abel. And then we saw what took place with the flood. Uh, so there were some tracks that we did related to the fall of man. And those stories continued to come up later in Scripture as well. And then the principle of restoration at the end of all those. We looked at some of that as well. You've got the children of Israel as well, which were God's chosen people. And you see the history of his people, uh, if one would uh, allow me to say such, beginning with Abraham uh, in that promise given to Abraham. And his people, if they continued to follow God, they were blessed. If they didn't, they weren't. And you see ultimately that culminating throughout the new covenant uh, and that we now are Abraham's seed if we're a part of the Lord's body. If we've been baptized into Christ, we're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise that was given hundreds of years before. So that was a track that I was also following through that series of the journey of man. Then you take a personal journey of man. We're born, we come into this earth, we're here for a period of time, and we will die. And that period of time is an important period of time for us. There is a second coming promise for us as well. So part of what we de dealt with was our coming and our journey and then ultimately the reality of death for us. And in that, there are several different aspects when we look at the journey of man. The creation, the fall, restoration. We looked at the prophecies of the man Jesus Christ as a part of that pre-existing before the world, but yet he was prophesied hundreds of years beforehand to come and bring a kingdom. The king is coming, coming into Jerusalem, uh, the church. The gospel plan of salvation was a part of that series. And then we looked at death, the day Christ came again. And then we looked at judgment, uh, heaven and hell. That was the outline of that study. I brought for you tonight a book uh, or a chart that was done hundreds of years ago, uh, which is pretty fascinating. And I'll throw a bigger aspect of that so you kind of see some of that. But y'all would might be interested in taking a look at this after services or whatever, but they start right here with Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel right here in this area right here. So Jesus would have pre-existed before this chart began and he was part of the creation. And then if you get to the other end of this chart and there's a timeline and there are dates all the way across that chart, you get to the end of that and we've got presidents of the United States. So it gives you a little bit of the the length of that time span. I'll show you why I'm uh, discussing this with you. But for tonight's purpose, I want to specifically look at the creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. If I was going to begin the journey of man, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning. So if we were going to look at a timeline, we're over here in the beginning. And then there's some things I want you to notice about in the beginning at the creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26. God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created, created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living creature or every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So a couple of things I want you to notice. God said, let us make man in our own image. I want you to notice a plurality of us 
and our. So when we talk about God being there in the creation, and even the Hebrew word for God, Elohim, that is in the very beginning, in the beginning God created, it is plural. It is God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And in the beginning, before Adam and Eve were created, let us make man in our own image, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So he pre-existed, and I might even use the terms they pre-existed before the beginning of the creation. And then Adam and Eve were created. Genesis chapter 2 specifically talks about uh, Adam. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Some of the other translations say a living being. He became alive. And God put life into this being, and God created life. And Adam was the, was the very first man. And then we have the story of Eve. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 21. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my blood, flesh of my flesh. And she should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked and the man, uh, both naked, the man and his wife and were not ashamed. Now I want you to notice in Genesis chapter 2, precursors, someone leaving father and mother and cleaving to spouse. Adam and Eve didn't have a father or mother. And yet that instruction was given in the very beginning of life with Adam and Eve, the man, Adam, being created. Genesis chapter 5, verse number 5, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. 930 years old. That's hard for us to grasp in our head because we're, not, we're used to a lifespan of 70, 80, 100 years maybe, but 930 years. Now there's some uh, very sundry creation scientists that have some theories behind the reason for that. I'm not going to get into every aspect of that. I'm not an expert on all that. But part of those theories have to do with it was a different earth than what we're currently living in. We're living in a destroyed earth after the flood. So when we look at the mountains and we look at uh, Mount St. Helens or we look at the Rocky Mountains or the Smoky Mountains, even in their own beauty, what we're looking at is really a wrecked earth that was not the way it was at the time men were living. Uh, there's talk in scripture about a canopy being over the earth, that there was no rain, the water, that there was a mist over the earth. And so we're talking about a different earth that in very possibly created an environment where people could live longer. And over a period of time, there has been DNA that has uh, decayed, let's use that word, uh, or diminished in its strength, and, and what you have today is a lot shorter lifespan. Lifespans are kind of going up right now, but they're still not going up exponentially. There's nobody living 930 years. But they are going up because of medicines and things like that to cure diseases. But those diseases would not have been present in this period of time in a different earth. So without going into all detail, the sermon's not about all that, but 930 years that Adam lived, and I just want you to think about that for a moment, and that's the reason I have this chart up here. Adam was still alive when Methuselah talked with Adam for 243 years. Methuselah died the year of the flood. Now I want you to get your head around that for just a moment because when you think about what is written down in Scripture, we would have the oral history of Scripture that there would have been 243 years of Adam's life that he would have shared with Methuselah. That's a long time, even in and of itself. And Methuselah died the year of the flood. So you've got Adam living right here. And I, you're not going to be able to see it, but I've got a little bigger chart for you, and I don't know that you can see it very well there. But this is the beginning of that chart. Adam and Eve... And then Seth comes on the, on the uh, scene. But you follow that red line right here, and that's the beginning of Methuselah. And for 243 more years, he would have lived at the same time frame that Methuselah would have been alive. And so when you think about him dying in the flood, that means he would have had contact with Noah and his family and their sons, and that oral history could have been handed down 
to, through these generations because they would have had time to be able to express those oral histories. So it's not unusual for us to think about the fact that we have a history today that's been written down for us to tell us what happened during that time period. I know it's hard for us to get our mind around the idea that somebody would live that long, but when you think about the journey of man, Adam lived a long time. Methuselah was the oldest person recorded in Scripture to have lived. Now, Enoch walked with God and was not and, and ultimately was taken. But Methuselah was 969 years old. If you come to my house and you want a Wi-Fi password, my Wi-Fi is, is called Methuselah Guest. If you were a guest in my home, Methuselah Guest. And the password for that Wi-Fi is 969 years. And there's a reason why I do that is it gives me opportunity to train and teach people how long Methuselah lived, 969 years. So 243 of those years, he would have been there with Adam. He would have been on the earth with Adam and a clan of people and that kind of thing, but, but would have had opportunity to have visited as well. So that oral history could have been shared. Adam to Lamech. Uh, Adam could have even spread word to Lamech for 56 years, Lamech to Shem, 98 years, uh, from creation to the death of Shem, 2,158 years. And you could follow that down this chart, and you could get to that date, 2,158 years from the creation of man until the death of Shem in that case. So let's look at the creation. In the beginning, I just want you to notice God. God was there in the beginning. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1 and 1. John 17 and verse number 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And I, I recognize this passage is talking about him being loved before the foundation of the world by God the Father, but he existed before the foundation of the world. We see some other scripture related to the fact that he was a part of creation as well. Job 38, verse number 1. This is where God is asking Job questions. He says, The Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare it, thou hast understanding. This is another thing that's hard for us to get our head around, but I want you to think about it for just a moment. The questions that's being asked of Job, Job's talking about all these different things that are happening. He's going, where were you when the foundation of the earth were created? You ain't got a clue what you're talking about is, in short, what God is telling Job. You don't know what you're talking about. You weren't there Years ago, Chase was in college down in this part of the country, down at Sam Houston. And we were studying together back in those days. And, and uh, he went to a college science classroom, and they started talking about billions and billions of years ago. And Chase raised his hand. He said, were you there? It didn't, take, it didn't go too well for the uh, university uh, teacher or the professor and Chase got called in after class and got talked to about the fact that he was interrupting and you know that kind of thing but I want you to think about the wisdom of that question for just a moment were you there billions and billions of years ago I wasn't there at the creation I'm taking the oral history that has been given to us that actually has time frames and ages and there's plausible explanation for that. But I recognize it's by faith. I recognize that. But again, I look around me and I see the evidence of the very things you see in Scripture. So when the Scriptures teach certain things, when I look around me, I see explanation for those things that make sense. There was a God and that he created. And then when I look at the annals of history and I look at man and I see the journey of man and I see the fall and because of sin and I see restoration and I see the wickedness of man when it comes to the days of the flood and then I see Ham, Shem, and Japheth go into different parts of the earth and populate the earth. All these things begin to make sense of what you see in our culture from a paleontology paleontological, however that word would be, uh, from that standpoint, it makes sense. What I see in the world today makes sense to what happened with the biblical record and the biblical account of what took place. But I want you to always think in terms, when you're sitting in classrooms or whatever and people are talking about things that happened billions of years ago, were you there? And here's the point. 
They're doing that based upon a belief system. They're telling you things based on a belief system. They believe certain things happened billions of years ago. I believe certain things happened less than billions of years ago or 6,000 years ago. But the reality is they're both belief systems. I just believe my belief system is based upon evidence that I see before me and evidence of that oral record as well. Psalm 19 and verse number 1, we've talked about that here I've even talked about it recently. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show with his handiwork. It does not take you very long to believe in God. When I look at the heaven and I look at the order of the skies, the order of the universe, and the order of the earth, what I read in scripture makes sense that there was a God in the beginning. God created. Romans 1 and verse number 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That verse basically says you're without excuse to not believe in God. Because you ought to be able to see the invisible things are clearly seen. It's kind of like seeing the wind. I don't see the wind, but I see the effects of the wind, and it's clear to me that something caused that. It's clear to me when I look at a tree and I look at the branches of a tree and the leaves of a tree, it's clear to me something caused that, that something happened that would have generated that in its life form. And I believe that that was God ultimately. And this verse is saying you're without excuse to not believe in God because you ought to be able to, even in the invisible things, it ought to be clear to somebody that there's something behind that, being understood that the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Psalm 14 and 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's a foolish position to not believe in a God. You have to really strain the intellect. Don't, I recognize we're straining the intellect when we start thinking about 969 years, but you have to really strain the intellect to say it came from nothing, that it came from absolutely nothing. Uh, my answer is it came from God, that there was an all-supreme, omniscient, omnipotent power behind everything that we see, and I recognize that stretches our minds, but I, th my other choice is it came from nothing, that something came from nothing, and I would rather believe in something than believe in nothing. That stretches my mind too far that I cannot begin to put my brain around the concept that nothingness brought something that makes no sense. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Jesus was there in the beginning. I've already mentioned that to you, but I want to show you some passages. Genesis 1, verse number 3, God said his spoken word was there. Let there be light, and there was light. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. What's, who's that verse talking about? It's talking about Jesus. All things were created by him and for him. He's before all things. So when we look at this timeline, not only in the beginning was God the Father, but in the beginning was God the Son. And Jesus was a part of that creation. His spoken, God the Father's spoken word was, let there be light. And there was light nine times in the first chapter of Genesis. God said something. God said, let it be, and it was. Nine times in that first chapter of the book of Genesis. Jesus was there in the beginning. He was a part of that creation. Prophecy given in Micah 5, verse number 2, O thou Bethlehem, afraid of, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth had been from old, from everlasting. He has always been. So before the beginning of this timeline, Jesus, and he goes infinity that direction, just like God the Father goes infinity that direction. And when you get past that timeline, and we're not at the end yet, so we don't know where the end of the timeline will be, but Jesus, God the Father, always, always will be, because they pre-exist the timeline of man. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So here again we see passage that says Jesus Christ was a part of the creation. Um, 
which from the beginning of the world has been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now under the principalities of powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith of him. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you which is your glory. And I want you to know how the manifold wisdom of God is going to be spread throughout the world. It's going to happen through the church. And we're going to see through this study that the church is a big part of that in fulfillment of prophecy and those kind of things. You and I are a part of that church. That's how the wisdom of God gets known to the world is through the church. And how does the world know that Jesus was a part of the creation? Through the church. We've got to be teaching uh, those facts and those principles as well. But Jesus was a part of that creation. And the Holy Spirit was a part of that creation as well. Genesis 1, verse number 2, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So there was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And by definition of God, and then I'm talking about deity. I'm talking about having God-like characteristics, okay? Separate personalities, but one in purpose, one in intent, one in focus, perfect unity. That's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Before the foundation of the world, I also want to remind you this evening, God knew us. He had a plan for us. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse number 5, talking about Jeremiah specifically, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Before Jeremiah even came on the scene, God knew him. And I want to tell you, God knows you. Before you ever came into this world, God knew you. That does not mean he took away your freedom of choice. It doesn't mean that he made you a rob robot or you can't control your decisions that you're making. I'm just saying he has foreknowledge of who you are and what you are and what, what uh, purpose you have in life. And ultimately that's fulfilled in his church, in being a part of his church and his kingdom. Before the founder of this world, God loved us. John 17 Verse number 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And I just want to tell you, before any of this began, God knew what he was doing, God understood what was going to take place, and God loved us and cared for us. And when you look down the history of time and the annals of time and you get over here and I think on this side of the pulpit you can see the crucifixion of Jesus about right here on this timeline. God knew the sacrifice it was going to take for mankind. He knew he loved you. He knew he loved you that much to send his only begotten son. John chapter 3, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world... Uh, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I was looking at Jerry because I heard he was in, in uh, Nigeria and blanked out on John 3, 16. It's happened to the best of us, Jerry, I promise you. Uh, Romans 8, we know all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. We get messed up at times when we read words like predestinate. I'm telling you, that predestination was predestined for his body, his church, to come into existence and his son to sacrifice his life for that kingdom that you and I have the ability to be a part of. He didn't individually predestinate you. Look at some YouTube videos of Timothy on the tulip doctrine. You can go back and review some of that. He didn't individually predestine us. Uh, so he didn't say, James, you're going to hell, and Ty, you're going to heaven, or vice versa. Uh, I had the freedom to choose and make decisions in life. But he predestined predestined us as a people. He predestined his church. If you're a part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, he knew about it before the world began. He foreknew everything that was taking place and that you and I can be conformed to the image of his son um, as we see in uh, Romans chapter 8. Before the foundation of the world, God had a plan for saving us. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times 
for you. Christ was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So before any of this began, before a timeline began, not only was God there and Jesus there and a part of the creation, but he knew what was going to take place through the annals of history. And he knew that his son was going to die on that cross of Calvary for our redemption. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This, these things have been foreordained for us. He's given a plan that we can follow. Second Peter chapter 3, we looked at this not too long ago, um, but this is the writing of Peter reminding us about the second coming. But this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. He said, there's people over here that are just saying, it's always been this way since the beginning of creation. It hadn't always been that way since the beginning of creation. In fact... Somewhere in here, in this time frame, there was a flood. And it's, I've got Ham and Shem and Japheth right in here somewhere. But there was a flood. There was a cataclysmic event that took place. And the things changed. Lifespans changed after the flood. It's very possible that the earth was shaken when the, when the foundations or, uh, from the deep, when the waters of the deep broke through, that the earth itself is different today than it once was. And we see storms and we see the rains and those kind of things. Everything hasn't began or hasn't continued the same since the beginning of creation. But he said it's real easy to lose faith because we look back and we think, well, today's like yesterday and yesterday was the day before and yet the day before that was just like the day before that. And the reality is across the annals of time, it isn't that way. There was a time before the creation when things were different. And there was a cataclysmic event when the creation happened and God spoke the earth into existence and he created man and man had a lifespan of 969 years or 960 years in the case of Adam. All things haven't always been the same and Peter is trying to remind us of those things. So as we look at this study, we've started with the creation, but then we're going to look at the fall. And it just happens time and time and time again in Scripture that God's people end up, God gives instruction and, and God's people have a tendency to reject his instruction, reject his counsel that he's giving us because he loves us and cares for us, which is a part of his plan. He wants you to be a part of his church. He wants you to be a part of his kingdom. But we have a tendency to reject it. And so we're going to look at the fall, we're going to look at restoration and the prophecies as we continue on with that study. If the church can help you this evening, I want you to know there's a reason you exist. You've got a reason to get up this morning. If you're ever feeling down, you need to cheer up because there's a reason you're here. You've got a reason is to make God look good, is to fulfill his purpose in your life. And there could be a lot of decisions you make in how to accomplish that. But at the end of the day, it's by the church the world is going to know the manifold wisdom of God. And this is an amazing plan before the creation of the world for you and I to be able to be part of his kingdom. We'll see that as we walk through this study. May God bless you in your Christian walk. And if the church can help you in fulfilling that purpose, whatever spiritual need you may have this evening... I know as brothers and sisters in Christ this evening, we want to lift each other up. We want to care about each other. We want to encourage each other. Certainly want to do that. Maybe you've never obeyed the gospel. Maybe we've got some here that have never been baptized into Christ. Tonight would be a great night to start that journey and realize that before the world began, he loved us, he knew us, he cared about us, and he loves you tonight. He's given you his church. He gave you his son to die on the cross of Calvary. He's giving you opportunity tonight to come to him and would encourage you to make that decision. And won't you do that while we stand and sing the song that's been selected?